Hi, this is Pastor Josh, and I just want to thank you for watching or listening to these teachings. Our hope is that through these teachings that you would learn more about God and grow closer to Him in relationship. But we also hope that these would be an additional teaching to what you already receive in your church home. If you don't have a church home, we would love to have you here at Cornerstone. So we do pray that through these teachings that you would hear God through the proclamation of His Word. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taking away and your sin atoned for. And so we're not going to look at every single verse here that we've read. We're going to look at one specifically. So turn your attention back to verse 3, will you? Because I want to kind of highlight this one. These are the seraphim, these angelic beings. Um, Now you just call them angels, but there's a specific type here called seraphim. And so they have six wings, two, they're flying, two cover their face, two cover their feet. And one of these seraphim said to the other seraphim in verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, that's capital Lord, so that's Yahweh, that is God Himself of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And so three times we have the word holy. We're going to be discussing And sharing, what does it mean for God to be holy? Holy, holy, holy. Our culture today has brought this word back into existence. It's kind of disappeared. That word holy disappeared for a while. Not many people used it. Now today, our culture has started to use this term but because of some popular people putting it in their songs. okay. So there's a group, or there's a country group, I guess you can call them that, they're new country, not old country. Um, they're called Florida Georgia Line. Okay? It's a country group. They wrote a song called Holy. It, the, it, it's actually an acronym. Um, high is the H, on is the O, L is loving, and then the, the Y is you. So it's an acronym, high on loving you. It's a country song, Florida Georgia Line, and, but obviously you see the play on words. It's holy. They're talking about holy. Let me read to you some of the words in which they um, say in their song. This was a song that came out in 2016, and by the second week, it moved from the 39th most popular song to the number one song here in America. Okay, So that tells you how fast it jumped. In one week, it jumped from 39 to number one, and this is... A verse and a chorus of this song. Now, I'm not going to sing it for you, okay? Because I don't have Florida Georgia Line voice. I'll just read it to you. But it says this, I couldn't find a day I didn't feel alone. I never meant to cry. I started losing hope. But somehow, baby, you broke through and saved me. You're an angel. Tell me you're never leaving because you're the first thing I know I can believe in. You're holy, 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 holy. I'm high on loving you, high on loving you. You're holy, 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 holy. I'm high on loving you, high on loving you. Okay? Number one song, just so you know. It, it, if you listen to it, Florida Georgia Line, they can sing. They got some good voices. Um, song, the, the musical part of the song sounds good. If you listen to it, it's very catchy. Neat little song. They use the term holy referring to a woman and you know the word high as when you get on drugs and you feel this experiential high and they're relating that this girl this individual that they have that sort when they see her when they're around her they get high and they're high on loving them they just want to love this girl more and more and more and so they call her holy 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 because they're high on loving her 
Number one spawn, number one song in America. Move from 39 to number one like that. So I, I, I share that with you so you know a little bit about our culture. You want to know what culture is thinking? Go to YouTube. Find out what the number one video is or what the top five videos are. Okay? You'd be shocked at what they are. Turn on the music. See what, what are the top songs of the day. Listen to what the message behind the song is. And that is the message that the culture is hearing. Here's another one. Another reason that we have Holy being popular today. This one's by Justin Bieber. Maybe you've heard of him. Maybe you haven't. Justin Bieber is a worldwide phenomenon. He, everyone knows him. Most people know him. Um, he wrote a song called Holy at the end of last year. And it became one of the top ten songs worldwide. Not just in America, worldwide. Okay. Here's some of his here's some of his words. And again, he's very talented. He can sing and has all the music that goes with, with it. He says this I hear a lot about sinners. Don't think that I'll be a saint, but I might go down to the river, uh, because the way that the sky opens up when we touch, yeah, it's making me say that the way you hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me, feels so holy, 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 holy. On God. This is like a rap part right here. Running to the altar like a drag star. Can't wait another second because the way you hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me, feels so holy. So the word holy is used today. It's used in our culture. Top 10 song, number one song for a while, two different songs, one country genre, one pop genre with a little bit of rap in there. There's another guy that sings in there. Our culture is familiar with the word Holy, and they use the word holy, and they sing the word holy, but they don't sing it to a holy God. Do you understand where I'm getting at? Do you understand what we're saying here? Setting the reality of where we're at as a culture. Here's the sad thing. You ready? Our culture is more familiar with the word holy in reference to a girl than it is to God. Now you ready for the ouch point? The reason they are is because people are putting effort and time and money and all that they have into producing music that is about holy. And the fact is, the church of God, which has the power of the Holy Spirit, more powerful than anything in the world, called the Holy Spirit, it's unlike anyone. Power of the Holy Spirit the church has, and it's supposed to be proclaiming a holy God to the world. And I think we failed. That's our ouch point. We have not proclaimed the holiness of God. So the world knows about holy when reference to girls, not God. And that's on us. So we have to just confess that to the Lord this morning. We say, God, we have failed to proclaim your name. And this nation does not know the holy name of God because of this, us, the church. So let us own that, let us confess that, and let us turn back to God. Amen, anyone? So he declares in Isaiah 6, verse 3, that God is holy, 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 three times. But yet, in the song, they don't refer to the woman as holy, 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 three times, but four. That's in the first one. Justin Bieber refers to her holiness five times. God himself doesn't declare himself holy more than three times, which is, we'll get into that in a little bit. But the world declares this relationship or these women holy four or five times, more than God would even use. That's where we're at as a culture, and we can say, Oh, the culture's bad, but the culture is that way because the church has not been responsible in what God has declared us to do. So we have to own it. So what does holy mean, y'all? Because we're getting mixed terms. High on loving you? What does it mean? What does it mean that God is holy? He reveals it to us in His Word. When you open up, if you have a concordance, it's basically like 
Um, it just looks up every word that's used and it shows you where it's used and how many times it's used. I have one online. I use my software one. So I just type in the word. So this week I typed in the word holy, popped up all these verses. And every time that it's used, it's used over 600 times in the Bible, the word holy. 600 times. So imagine trying to read through all those verses. That's a lot of verses, right? When you look at that word, it basically comes down to two different definitions, which they're combined. But number one, the word means set apart. It means different. It means distinct. It means unique. It means special, not ordinary. That's what the word means. The second use of the word is referring to God and that God is morally perfect, that there is none that like him, that he is above and beyond all else morally. He is pure. Those are the two uses. So let's look at this first one of the word holy, just meaning set apart. And I want to give you this example here. Um, some of y'all grew up in the generation that had China in their house, okay? Not made in China, not those sorts of things. China, the, the dinnerware, the dishware, or however you want to call it. The, the, the fancy plates and the bowls and the cups that would go in a China cabinet, right? And so you'd walk in and you would just see these dishes and bowls in a glass cabinet. Now, if you grew up with that, you knew that this was not to be used every day. This was a special type of plate and a special type of bowl. You don't just pour your cereal into this bowl. Mom will slap you upside the head, right? The, this china, you knew that if you walked into the room, the table was set and the china had, was out of the china cabinet and placed on the table that something special was happening in your household. You knew that just by that. You knew someone special was coming over or this was a special circumstance or a celebration that they were having because you did not, they call it, break out the china, get it out of the cupboard or whatever, for ordinary use, for breakfast cereal. You don't do that. But for special use. This is how the word holy is used in the Scripture. It is used in reference to items or objects or people or places that are set apart for special use, not for ordinary use. They are distinct. They're not like anything else. And when you see them, just like when you see the, the table with China on it, you know something special is happening, everyone. That's how that word is used. It's used of clothing. In Exodus 28, 4, it says this. These are the garments, okay, which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broided coat, a, a mitter and a girdle, and they shall make holy garments. These are special clothes, clothes set apart for special purposes. Holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister unto me, that's God, in the priest's office. So you see the word holy applied to clothing that God has set apart for a special use, a special purpose. In Genesis chapter 12, you find out that there is a land that is holy. It says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So there is literal ground, y'all. Dirt, grass, rocks, mountains, rivers that is holy. Like China. It is set apart. It is used for a special purpose. It was the people of Israel. God was bringing them. He's saying, you are a special people. This is a special land. And when other people come here, they need to know this is not ordinary land. This is my land where I'm at. In Exodus 3.5, he tells um, uh, Moses here, do not come any closer. Okay, Moses sees the burning bush. And, so imagine this is a bush over there. Moses come and God says, don't come any closer. So Moses stops. He says this, God said, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Now this is a set apart dirt and land because the presence of God is here. He says this was normal dirt and now he, he, 
Now Moses or God shows up and now it's become holy. And he says, if you get too close, you're going to die. He says, stop. Now take off your sandals because this is a special place. You don't walk on this ground like you walk on every other ground. This is set apart. This is distinct. This is unique. And you need to pay attention to that, Moses. The Israelite people had a tabernacle, or in other words, they had this tent they would set up, and it was where they would meet God. Their leaders would go in to meet God. So they set this tent up. In Exodus 25, it says this, Let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell in their midst, I may be in their midst, exactly as I show you, concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so shall you make it. And if you read... The Old Testament, you'll look in there and God says, hey, I want this curtain to be this long with, with these rings and I want this room to be this big and that wide and I want these seraphim, um, cherubim people, I want this to be just like this with their wings out of this and, and I've made people with gifts who know how to work with gold and know how to sew. You should look at the curtains and, and the sewing pattern and the colors that God has. And He says, this is it. It's supposed to be just like this. No other way, this way. Which, let me pause and come out here for a minute. You have gifts because God wants you to use those gifts. He used someone who sewed for His glory. He used the, the carpenter for His glory. He used the traveler who would go and, and get the, the wood and bring it back. So we all have gifts for the glory of God that He's given us that we need to use for his glory. He's very specific here. So do y'all not think that, just so you know, if God was that specific about His tabernacle and His people and His land, do you not think that He is that specific and detailed about, watch here, His church, you and I, how we're to do things when we gather, why we gather, when we gather, what we're called to do. We don't get the freedom to just say, you know, God, this is your pattern of curtain in the tabernacle. I don't like it. None of the sowers said that. They did what God told them to do. If they, did, if they didn't, they'd be kicked out. It's the same with a church, with us as a family. We need to be about what God is about, which means we need to know His Word. If you don't know His Word, you won't know who He is. Here we go. We'll keep on going. He says of a mountain, Exodus 34, 3. No one else may come with you, Moses. In fact, no one is to appear anywhere on the mountain. Watch this, y'all. Exodus 34. No one is to appear anywhere on the mountain. Do not even let the flocks or herds graze near the mountain. He says, my presence has come down on this mountain, Mount Sinai. And he says, this is a special, unique mountain. I'm going to allow you, Moses, to come up here and speak with me for the people of Israel. But do not let anybody else touch the mountain. In fact, don't even let the sheep get close to the mountain because anything that gets here is going to die. Because I'm so set apart from you. You, don't, you can't even comprehend these things. And then he says to the people of the nation, Genesis 12 and Leviticus 19, he says, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. So we have references to the word holy. And the reference is God setting something or some place or, or some people aside for a special use, for a special purpose with Him. The difference between the China cabinet and Israel or the China cabinet and the church or China cabinet and the Christian or the China cabinet and just the, the land. The difference is, it's not merely a human setting it apart for special use. It is God Himself who sets it apart for special use. We set China apart for special use, but China isn't holy because of that. China would be holy if God said, I want you to set these plates and dinnerware aside for special use. Then we could say, this is holy China. But he doesn't. So that's the difference. Holiness applied to it is applied only when God does the work. He showed up with Moses, right? Don't get here because I'm here and my presence is here. And now because I am here, this is a holy ground. We can't make ground holy. You can't do some chant. You can't do some magic to make this pulpit holy. This 
pulpit here would only be holy if God said, this is a holy pulpit. This piano would only be holy if God says, this is a set-apart holy piano. But he doesn't do that. So we need to recognize what is holy because of what God has set apart and what is not because of what we have. And so we have holy because God sets it apart. And here's the truth. The reason it's holy because He sets it apart is because He is holy. Isaiah 6, look at it again, verse 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. God in His nature is holy. He's the only one who can set things apart which make them holy. So that's the second use of our word. And it's in reference to the purity, the moral purity, the nature of who God is. He is holy. Three times it says it. R.C. Sproul, he wrote it this way. This is how he said it. If you, if you want to, uh, to read a book, read The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul. Read The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul. In this book, he references this, holy, 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 and he says this. You don't see them proclaiming Love, love, love. He goes on in some of his messages to say, you don't see him saying God is just, just, just. Or righteous, righteous, righteous. In the Scripture, you see them proclaiming that God is holy, holy, holy. When it's used three times, it was symbolic. It was a symbol for us to recognize the emphasis that is being placed upon this word. Today we bold it, right? Just put it in bold or underline it or whatever, highlight it, and you'd say, okay, we're emphasizing God is holy. If you're sending a text, you use those gifs and memes and emojis. You would use special ones for, for God. You'd say, okay, this is what we're using. It was an emphasis to, to understand that God is holy. And so guess what, everyone? The Word of God is before us. The Word of God is being proclaimed to you and I, which means this. We have a revelation before us today. The revelation is what? God is holy. That's the revelation that you and I have right now. So when we face God one day, and we all will face Him, whether you believe it or not, you won't be able to get out of this reality. I didn't know, God, that you were holy. Because we've just been told that He's holy. So what does that mean for our lives? What are we to do? How do we need to dive into this a little bit more to understand it? There's a song by David Crowder called No One Like You. It says, there, there is no one like you. There has never been anyone like you. There is never, ever, 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 ever been anyone like you. There is none like you. You are holy, God. That's what we're getting at. There is none like you. God. He is the Creator who's created us. We have life because He gives us life. But He does not need it because He has life within Himself. That's a holiness. That is a set-apartness. We have goodness because God has given us goodness. God has goodness within Himself. He does not need it. We have wisdom and knowledge and can learn because God has given us these things. But God Himself, He has all the knowledge. He has all the wisdom. He has all these things in Himself. That's what sets Him apart. He is holy. We do try to do right things, or, and sometimes we do wrong things. But only God is the one who only does what is right all the time, every day. That's what makes Him holy. God is holy. There is none like Him. There is... None like Him. Not the greatest people that you can think of. I don't know who that is for you. Some of our people in our culture would say Gandhi is one of the best people in the world. Mother Teresa is one of the best people in the world. Oprah, maybe Ellen. These people who do good things. And that's really what it is. They either try to be peacemakers or they just give a lot. They give good gifts to people. But... None of them could come up to God and be considered pure, right, good. When God shows up, their sin would be revealed. Their brokenness would be revealed. And they would be found unholy. 
This happens to a man in the Old Testament by the name of Uzzah, or Uzzah, however you want to pronounce his name. Uzzah was traveling with the ark, okay? If you don't know what the ark is, ark was a big box, a special box that God had made. It's called Holy Ark. And inside the ark was the Ten Commandments and um, the manna. You know, God fed him with manna. He said, I want you to scoop some up, put it in a jar, and then put it in the ark so that you will forever remember that I fed you in the wilderness. And so all these things, these special things are in the ark, holy things. The ark is holy itself. God says in his word that when you travel, it's supposed to be the priests, these special people, the Levites, that, that take the ark and they're supposed to carry it. They put it in the rings and they're to carry it by hand. Well, they're moving the ark and they didn't listen to God. They're moving it by a mule and the ox is carrying the, the ark on, let's say, a little trailer. And so... Uzzah is right there walking. And the ark begins, because the ox hit this bump, the ark begins to shake. Now, we're not told if it's going to fall off or not. We're told it's losing its position, so we can say it was going to fall off or it was about to fall off or it was out of order. And Uzzah sees the ark move maybe about to fall out, and he reaches out with his hand and pushes it back where it was supposed to be. And in that moment, God strikes him dead. Go read your Bible. He kills him for touching a box, for moving a box back into place. Well, remember the background. They weren't supposed to be carrying it this way anyways. They're supposed to be carrying it by hand. By hand and it's supposed to be a special people. Well, Uzzah reaches out and pushes it back. Now listen here. Uzzah had good intentions. Uzzah in his mind was thinking, this thing's about to fall. It's out of place. It's going to hit the dirt. I don't want it to get to hit the dirt. I don't want it to get dirty. This is God's box. Let me just move it back. Hmm. I think we all would say, good intentions, Uzzah. You didn't want God's box to be in the dirt, so you pushed it back. Good intentions. But God says your intentions, your heart is not enough. You must be obedient to my word. It is both heart and action. Not just action and not just heart. It is both combined. Uzzah, in a sense, had a good heart. Even though he was disobedient to God in this sense. It was a bad heart. But he had a good heart in his intention wanting to save this ark. And God kills him because he touched the holy object, an object set apart by God, in the wrong way. An object. Not God himself. An object that God set apart as holy. He kills him. Think about this. Us as a man, a human, Scripture says that God formed us out of the ground, the dirt, Scripture says that from dust we are born and from dust we shall return, yes. So, listen, the Scripture reveals that Uzzah is dirt. Uzzah's dirt. He is dirt with life breathed into it. God has given life to Uzzah. That's why he's not just dirt. He is a human now. But he's dirt. Now, the ark was going to fall, possibly, on dirt. And it would have been better for the ark to fall on the dirt because Uzzah wouldn't have died. Here's the difference between Uzzah and the dirt. Listen closely. Uzzah, made from dirt, is dirty. But the dirt on the ground was not dirty. Okay? Follow with me. Uzzah, who's made from dirt, is dirty. But the dirt on the ground is not dirty. Let me explain it to you. When God created the ground and He said, dirt, you be dirt. It has been dirt and it's always been dirt. Dirt has never sinned. Dirt has never been disobedient to to God. So dirt is not dirty in that sense. But Uzzah, who was created from dirt and life breathed into him, God gave him an order of life and he disobeyed, therefore becoming dirty. So the ark was dirty because Uzzah was trying to touch it. It would have been better for the ground, for it to hit the ground. Our hearts are not enough 
to obey the Lord. You have to be obedient to the Word. This is a, a warning for us in a sense. That as His people, we can't just simply say, you know, I love people and I want to share this with God. I want to share people with this and I want to do this. I want to do this program. And it's like, that is not enough. And I have to warn us before God strikes us dead because we're touching the ark in a wrongful manner. What does God say? Now, align your heart with what God says and see what God does does in our life but we have far too many churches and individuals maybe us ourselves who are doing things either just from heart and motive or just doing things from scripture and god calls us to do both together god is holy he set apart this object uzzah dies over an object and he's not even in the presence of god He's in the presence of an object that God made holy. So what does that tell you about the presence of God? I'll say this. As a sin was found out by touching a holy object, you can be certain that your sin will find you out when you come into the presence of God. Hear me? There's a lot of songs today, new songs that talk about the presence of God. I'm very weary of these songs, not just because of this. I want to be cautious. Because the songs, they say, oh God, your presence is here and we feel you and you're awesome and you're wonderful and your love is here and I'm, I'm overwhelmed and I'm moving. And it's all excitement and joy and happiness and, and celebration and that's the emphasis of the song is, oh God, you're here and I'm so happy. Which is, that it, there's a truth to that. Don't hear me wrong. There's a truth to that. But when you read the Scripture, it's overwhelming that when people come into the presence of God, they see the holiness of God. And the first response to God isn't, oh, how happy I am, how great you are. The first response to the presence of God is a burden and a woefulness upon yourself because you see your sin in the true light. Isaiah saw it here. Verse 4. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, How happy I am that I'm in the presence of God! How joyful I am! Let us clap and laugh and shout. Isaiah says, Woe is me! For I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people. He recognizes his own nation, his own people of unclean lips. Watch this. That's his response to this. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And right before all this is where the cherubim or the seraphim proclaim, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So Isaiah comes into the holy presence of God and seeing the holy presence of God, he sees his own sinfulness, a prophet of God, the, the called out one of God, the one who would hear from God. And he cries out, I am dirty, I am lost, I am unclean because you are holy and my people are unclean. Woe is me. I am dead. There is nothing I can do in your holiness, God. Woe is me. This is what Paul, Paul recognized this as he was walking down the road and God showed up in the light and he began to talk to him. And later on we read in his letters uh, of him seeing his sinfulness in those moments. Same thing. Paul didn't immediately jump into the joy and say, oh, how great I get to see God finally. It was a recognition of sin, of their brokenness. So their cult, our culture is shouting the opposite. I just got to tell you, our Christian culture, not the culture, our Christian culture is shouting the opposite of these very words of God. I point you to the text, not so that you could 
say this is Joshua's message so that you could say, what has God said? And it's in opposition of what our culture is saying. Paul says it. So God is not bad like some people think. And we are not as good as we think we actually are. I'll give you this illustration. Imagine I come into your house. Let's just say your room, okay? We're going to use this as an analogy for you as a person. Imagine I come to you and you're going to show me your room. You've got your own bedroom. Walk into your bedroom and you say, my room is clean. Well, I can't see anything. It's pitch black in your room. There's no lights. I don't know if it's clean. You tell me it's clean. And I'm kind of walking and I'm stumbling over some objects. It feels like maybe some clothes and some rustling of some trash. But I'm not sure. I don't know what that is. You say it's clean. I can't see. It's pitch black. You can't see nothing. You're, it's pitch black in here. You say it's clean. I don't know. You can get away with it with me. You can get away with it with me because I don't have those eyes to see. But when you bring God into the room, there's a, there's a song that says, when you walk into the room, everyone shouts and, and pray all these sorts of things. And we've got to be cautious because when God walks into the room, it's no longer darkness because God is light. The light has come into the room and it reveals the reality of the room. And all of a sudden, the room that you said was clean, your life, you see the clothes in the corner. You see the bugs flying everywhere. You see the trash on the floor. You see the stains on the wall. And you look at your room because God is coming to the room and the light is on. And you see the filth and you see who God is, who is holy, pure, no filth, no brokenness, no, none of these things. And, and the first thing you say is what Isaiah says here. Oh, woe is me, God. I thought my room was clean, but it's not. It's not clean and there's nothing I can do. You already saw it. It's a mess. What do I do? Woe is me. That is a necessary response for anybody who says, I've been in the presence of God. It is a necessary response. Because it's a truthful response. Now we must not make the error because I say that and that's the truth. You must have the woeful as me if you said you have the presence of God. That is true, but it doesn't stay there. It moves forward in grace. See, you look at your room and you say, woe is me. And if you keep looking at your room with God, that you're just going to say, woe is me, woe is me. What am I to do? There's no hope. I'm in despair. Uh, I'm depressed. What am I to do, God? I'm going to try to clean this up. And you can't clean it. It's stained. Your whole room's a mess. There's nothing you can do to clean it. It's just the way it is. You can try to put some things in order, but it's still a mess. It's still a junkyard. Your life, in other words. Now, in comparison to us, we can't see. But in comparison to God, He sees. And when you're in the presence of God, when you know God, you realize that. You say, what was me? So stop now looking at your room. Recognize your room. And turn back to God. Because he walked into the room. Which means he has something to say to you. Turn back to God and listen to what he says. This right here is what he says to us. It's a story of his grace. Of who he is. We're here this morning to celebrate Jesus. Jesus, a man, and God himself, came from heaven lived a perfect life, never messed up. His room was clean. But He died. He took on our sin, our dirty rooms, so that we could have a clean room. He's like our older brother, in a sense, who takes care of us. And the Father comes in. But instead of coming into our room, Jesus says, hey, if you'll, if you'll just trust Me, I'll take care of it for you. I'll take care of it for you. Because I love you and my Father loves you and we want to do this for you. And he says, do you trust me? Do you trust what I'll do for you? Yeah, I trust you. What do you want me to do? Dad's coming. Here, jump into my room. My room's clean. I'm going to take your room. And Jesus takes our filth, our, pain, our, our, our defilement, takes it upon Himself. That's why He dies on the cross. And He gives us His life, a pure, clean room, so that when the Father walks in, we can say, God, 
Father just looks at us and he says, you're perfect. You're perfect, my son, my daughter. You're perfect. Oh, I love you. We're going to spend eternity. I can be here because I am holy. I am pure. And I can't be in this defilement. But in purity, I can be here. That is the good news of God, y'all. That is what the gospel is. The gospel is good news. It is news that is set apart for a special purpose for people to hear this news. We say, woe is me. That's a necessary first response to the presence of God. But then we go into the wonderful news of Jesus and we say, oh, how great is he? How great is he that he would save me? Isaiah. Turn Isaiah 6, 6. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal. This fiery coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar in God's presence. He touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Which in verse 5, he says, I am a man of unclean lips. He's searing it off, that, that hot coal. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. So there is a woe is me, but there is a wonderful look at Jesus. Wonderful is he moment. In the presence of God. And this all stems from God being holy. In 1 Peter, he says this to the church. Be holy, for I am holy. And the only way we can be holy is by living life in Christ Jesus. Now let me reference this first part, the word holy again. He calls us to be holy because he's holy. Why? Because we're like the china on the wall. China in the cabinet. He says, I am setting you aside. When you trust in Jesus, I am setting you aside from all of the world. And you are going to be used for special purposes and celebrations for my glory. Are you ready? Are you excited about this? Here's one of the problems with our, but not with our church. Maybe it's with you. Maybe with it's just church in general. But here's the problem is that we recognize that we're called to be special, but we sit in the China cabinet. That's it. We just sit in the China cabinet com comfortably. Like, I, hey, I like hanging out here. Good view. Temperature's good. I don't ever get dirty. Just hanging out. The purpose of China isn't just to sit there in beauty, but to be pulled out in order to serve and bless others. You hear me? That's what China is. You use it to eat off, to serve other people. When God calls us to be holy through Jesus, He's not calling us to sit in the China cabinet. He's calling us to get out and to serve the world and to bless the world for His purpose. That we as holy people, we would go and people would be in the very presence of God like they were with Moses. Moses had the shining face. It was the presence of God, a symbol of that. That we as a people would walk into our community, whether it's the school or wherever you're working or we're retired or your family or whatever it is, that you would walk into these areas and they would say, wow, the presence of God is here. I don't know where it's at, but it's here. And that the life that you give in would be a serving life, a blessed life to tell them about this beautiful news that God is holy. Woe is me, but wonderful is He. So, God is holy. We know that. But are you? Are you holy? Holiness only comes through Christ. 